Hey, what's up guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and today we're going to be covering common fishing mistakes. I'm going to show you how to address it, make sure you don't do it yourself, and you're going to become a much more effective angler. I've seen some of these videos before, and the stuff is just so blatantly obvious. It's like, when you're stepping over a boat dock, don't trip over the thing. Uh, come on. Now, I'm going to go into more elaborate mistakes, something if you were on my boat and I seen you doing it, I'd be like, oh, come on, man. But I would tell you. Okay, so first things first, I have down here landing fish with the line or bad netting. And what I mean by this is, a lot of people think as soon as you get the fish to the side of the boat, it's good, hey, you won, hey, good job, all right. Well, in bass fishing, a lot of the time, we don't use nets. It's just the cool thing, we like to do that because in a lot of tournaments, you're not allowed to use nets. Um, so I'm gonna cover that first. Now, when I say landing that fish, a lot of the time, that fish is down in the water, and we have our line back here behind us. Rod's laying down in the boat, and the fish is swimming down there. I've seen guys do this and wrap that line around their hand and start trying to pull the fish up to grab its lip. That's a huge no-no. What happens is, when you're fighting a fish, you use drag. So, you know, they can pull line off, pin the line back, and your rod's a cushion. So it's giving you that cushion. So in theory, you want to maintain the same thing when you're getting close to the fish, but you can't necessarily hold your rod in your time, uh, hold your rod in your hand at all times. You want to hold the line so you can get really close and start moving them around to where you can grab them. What you want to do is keep a light amount of pressure in between your fingers to where if he does run, you're not jerking that plug or reshifting that lure in his mouth. So never wrap your fingers around like that and pull. Keep it between your hands. Use your, you can use your index and your middle finger. Never try to apply your whole hand, otherwise you're starting to put angle in the line. If he lets go, it's gonna go boing and it's gonna pop. If you hold like that, he can turn smoothly, he can still take line. You can try to lift, you can take your other hand, slide it back through. So you're gonna lose less fish like that at the side of the boat. Um, now, bad netting. Another thing, let's say we're, we're trolling or we're out bait dunking and we're gonna net a fish from the bank. Let me grab my net here. Now I have a rubber band around this, but if you have a shorter net, you can grab the back of the net with your left hand or vice versa with your right hand if you're a lefty or your righty, doesn't matter. And this is called trigger gripping. You take it with your index finger, you hold it behind and you go down. That way, if you miss the fish, the net doesn't blow back through and you're trying to turn and the net's getting twisted around. You want a trigger grip to hold it. Now, this net extends, or a lot of the time we're using nets with extremely long handles. Now, people, you've seen, if you've been out trolling or you're fishing in the current, you go to net that fish, sometimes you'll put the net down there and the net will blow back under the rim of the net and it'll be out here. And you'll end up snagging a lure right there in the front of that net. So what I oftentimes suggest people do is take big rubber bands, just like I did here, and go around the tip of that net, pull it back against the handle. In that case, once the fish jumps in there, boom, it pops loose, and you got him, and you're good to go that way. When you're netting, it's always head first on the fish. Make sure he's going in. Don't get so far to where you're right on the edge to where that's your maximum reach. What's gonna happen is that you're gonna start stabbing at the fish. You're gonna be out there, it's gonna be too far. You're gonna end up bumping him. He's gonna rub the lure on the edge. Until you can get that fish dead center and you're positive you can get him dead center, don't stab at him with the net. If he's right here over the rim and he hits on here and gets a hook there, it's gonna pop free, you're gonna lose the fish. If you got him to the boat, more than likely he's gonna get there all the way, so make sure you can get him in the center of that net. Okay, now another common mistake I see made, a huge one that all anglers make, and even myself, I can make it from time to time when I get frustrated out there on the water, is lack of awareness. And what I mean by lack of awareness is paying attention to your surroundings. Oftentimes, nature is going to tell you, and it also is going to dictate where you need to be fishing. And you could say, well, I've caught fish here before, I've caught fish there before, that's where I'm going to go, and you'll ignore, off in the distance, birds diving. You'll see a whole bunch of turn birds, seagulls, gulls, whatever, diving over into a corner if you just happen to look around when you got there. Or you'll see, you're standing there at the boat dock, you're launching the boat, and this has happened when I'm very aware in the morning and I'm focused on what I'm doing. I'll look over off into there and I'm like, what, what's going on in that cove? And I'll see bait rolling up there. So like bass or trout or whatever I'm fishing for that day was working bait. I went over there. First things first, I capitalized in the morning and crushed them. And that had nothing to do with my agenda, and that was strictly from awareness. 
Um, another thing with awareness is look, look what the wind's blowing on. A lot of the time you'll get there, you have a plan, you'll say, well, the wind is blowing to the east, I'm going to fish the east, but all of a sudden that day, it's blowing to the southeast. And you get out there, and you look, and you say, well, let's go look for points over there. And you go over there, you see that water rolling up on that point, you see birds working there, and that's just good awareness. A lot of the time, you'll be passing by, and you'll see anglers hammering fish, and you'll, you'll see that they have fish on. What should you be aware of? Well, that they're catching fish right there. If you go try your spots, it might be a better idea that something just happened to happen over there. That doesn't mean you should go follow people around that you think are better fishermen than you by any means. Don't do that. Just keep good awareness at all times because it's very easy to become distracted or frustrated in a boat. And confidence and awareness is an extremely important tool when you're fishing. I can't tell you how many times where I've lost a big fish at the boat I'm extremely frustrated, I lose my focus, and for the next hour I don't catch anything, and then all of a sudden I get, I get myself back into the right state of mind and I say, oh, you know what? I think I'm just slightly outside my bite window. The tide went down where the tidal system I was fishing, or ah, now the sun's out from behind those clouds. And if I would have stayed focused on what my agenda was and really utilize that and just say, ah, oh, you know what, it happens, I tried to do as best as I could to get that fish, fish came off, let it go. The faster you can let that go, the more time you're going to have in a fishing day, the more effective cast you're going to make. You know, it only takes a few casts to catch a couple incredible fish. That makes the difference between an expert and a novice. So you have to keep that in mind. Positive energy, remaining focused, and not getting frustrated over what happens. Good 20 to 30 percent of our fishing day is tied up with switching between lures or tangles that we have. Even us professionals have that problem where we get backlash on our reels. We have to address it. And if we get frustrated over that time, it's going to cost us for the guy who's not frustrated. And he stays focused, gets it done. He's out there. He's more effective. He caught more fish than you and say, oh man, he must have got lucky. No, he was focused. He was positive and he knew exactly what to do. And he maintained that mindset. So keep that in mind. There we go, baby. Now here's another thing I see, even professional anglers making mistakes from time to time because they have a favorite knot. And I'll tell you what, there's the right knot for the job, and yes, there's a few right knots for each type of line. Uh, nowadays, we're commonly fishing with fluorocarbons, copolymers, monos, basically nylon base lines, and braided lines. These are three very common lines. Each line has special knots, each line has its advantages, and each line has its disadvantages. Um, oftentimes, I see guys, like, they learn the Palomar knot, and they, yeah, strongest knot in the world. Okay, there's, there's, yeah, it's more than likely the strongest knot in the world. It works incredible for braid. It's incredible for braid. Uh, the one problem is braid's slightly slick to where if you tie a Palomar and you cut your tag in too short, a lot of the time it'll slip a little bit. So nowadays we're using the double Palomar when we're using braid to prevent that slippage. Um, mono, that doesn't really happen when you're using mono and you tie a single Palomar. Great knot. You can do clinch knots on mono. You can do everything because um, mono can squeeze in on itself. It's fine. It stretches. Um, it doesn't slip too much. Now we go into fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon is extremely dense. We have to use knots that don't cut in on themselves. They don't fasten against each other. They're either around the line or they have the smooth twist to that knot, not forcing itself back on there. Mo um, when you're using fluorocarbon, if you do a Palomar knot, you're gonna be breaking off. Like this is a six pound test right here. You'll probably break with about three or four pounds of pressure if you did a Palomar knot on there without even realizing that you need to use a different knot because fluorocarbon is extremely dense. It's like glass, it can, it can break itself. Um, so the improved clinch knot's a great knot for fluorocarbon. There's uh, the fluorocarbon knot, I think, that's getting popular now. Uh, for your monos, your Palomar, your snells, your clinch knots work great for that. Um, for your braid, the others work good for that as well, but double palomars, what I suggest always when using braid. So keep that in mind. You have to use the right knot for the right line, and you're going to catch a heck of a lot more fish, and you're going to have less break-offs that way. We go. Got a nice Another huge mistake I see a lot of the high-end anglers, professionals, amateurs, everybody still does it. I even I started talking to a buddy, and I'll do it. Repeating the same cast and not changing it up, not changing your cadence or anything like that, that means just the way you retrieve it is the cadence. If you pop, pop, pause, or pop, 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 pause, that's just your retrieval cadence. A lot of the time I'll go out there, guys, cast, 
exact same spot, really exact same speed, do the exact same thing, and cast again. When you make that same cast to that same spot and do the exact same thing, do you really think your odds increased? I don't, but I've done it strictly because I get road stare and start doing the same thing. A lot of the time, if you're going to repeat that cast, let your bait fall further. Make sure it gets down. Change your cadence up. Make sure, you know, you're working the surface, you're working the middle, you're working the bottom. And change your retrieval speed. Give those fish something new to look at because they clearly told you on your first cast they didn't want what you did. And you just repeated what they didn't want even more because you showed it to them twice and now they're becoming acclimated to your bait. You know, if we didn't swap the fly the first time he flew right here, we're probably not going to swat him the second time. So keep that in mind. What you want to do also is change your angles. We call it angling when you're out there casting for predator species. And what I mean by changing your angle, if I'm casting to this spot right over here, shift the boat around or step over if you're from the bank and change your angle. Now your bait's coming through at a different direction each time, whether that fish is positioned under a log that sits like this, he's positioned like this, you're giving him new looks, you're giving him different types of retrievals, you're moving it slower, you're continuously changing it. And you want to make sure you always do that when you cast to the same spot. You'll have a co-angler in your boat, somebody behind you, and they're throwing the exact same thing and they nail like a big old fish and you're like, dude, I just threw to that spot. He or she did something entirely different than you and that fish was ready to take it at that point. So casting to the same spot, Keep in mind that you have to change it up or change your angle. It's a fish fry. Now, a lot of the time we get out there stuck fishing windy days. Now, this is where it's brutal and wind frustrates a lot of anglers, but the wind is our friend. Where the wind is blowing is where the bait is, the you know small organisms, the zooplankton are moving in there, the, the shad are moving in there, the minnows are moving in there to feed, and the bigger fish are going to feed on those. If you try to get out of the wind for your own comfort, you're shooting yourself in the foot. The wind is your friend. Keep it in mind. Now, when you get over there, if you're fishing light tackle, it could be extremely difficult. If you're fishing heavier tackle, it could still be extremely difficult. You need to fish according to the wind and you need to focus on techniques that you can utilize with that wind. For example, I'll still go out and chuck eight pound tests, a little tiny wacky rig or a drop shot in the wind. The simple thing I'll do is you never wanna move a light bait up against the wind or against the current. It's extremely unnatural. But at the example, if you used a drop shot, you could throw right to that particular tree and keep it there and twitch it. But you want the wind directly to your back. So there's not a big bow in your line. It's basically straight at your target. Another thing you can do once you make your cast to keep your bow out is actually stick your rod tip down in the water and that'll eliminate the wind. It's a little bit weird, a little bit odd and frustrating sometimes, but you want to do is put your finger now on the line as you're fishing it. Or if you have a bait caster, keep your finger on the line when you stick your rod tip under because that water is going to yield your bite detection on your rod blank itself. You could feel it on your finger a lot faster. So you could stick your rod tip under after the cast to get that line out of the wind to bury it. Uh, mono sits on the surface, braid sits on the surface. Uh, if you're fishing the wind, fluorocarbon is a great choice because the line partially sinks. Uh, it's much more versatile to fish in the wind. Another thing, um, if you are going to fish across the wind, if you can get that sun going on fluorocarbon, you can see it and you can see that bow in your line. Anytime you have a big sideways bow in your line, what you need to focus on is watching the line. No longer feeling the bite, no longer detecting it, putting your finger on the line. You need to stare at that line. Do not take your eyes off. That's where a good pair of polarized glasses comes into hand. That reflection, it blocks out the reflection. You can see deeper on the water. You can see fish moving around oftentimes where your buddies don't have them. Uh, that's why I rock the blue fin eyewear polarized glasses right here. Awesome glasses, you gotta check them out by the way. When you're looking at that line, you'll see something different. The wind bows in there, you'll see a little whoop, it'll come out or you'll see your line move against the current, reel down and set the hook at that point. You're actually looking at the bow in your line and using it as a strike indicator. So if you have bow in your line, stare at it. If you're bank fishing and there's no wind and you have too much slack in your line, get the slack out because you're not gonna detect bites if that's what you're doing. Uh, if you're trolling and you have slack in your line, you're not moving. <laughs>
Okay, let's cut for a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. Did you know that Beeline makes specialized lines for all your fishing needs? From the super strong, abrasive resistant CXX or the low stretch, super stealthy CX Premium. Or maybe you're looking for invisibility or super bite detection with Beeline's 100% fluorocarbon. No matter what your needs, Beeline's got it covered. To find out more, visit Beeline.com. Beeline, baby! Are you ready for a pair of polarized sunglasses that's going to improve on your fishing game? Well, Bluefin Eyewears address all the current issues with fishing glasses. No more pressure discomfort behind the ears. They're super lightweight with improved face gripping technology and not to mention a lifetime warranty. BluefinEyewear.com, guys. Check it out. Ever tried pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Have you been to RustyLures.com? Did you know they offer free shipping on anything over $29.99? And with all the latest and greatest in bass fishing gear from punching tackle, umbrella rigs, swim baits, and you name it, there's really no reason for you not to be getting the best deal online today. So go to www.RustyLures.com. Did you ever wish for an RC boat when you were a kid? And do you have a passion for fishing? Well, guess what? It's time to do them both at the same time. With RCFishingWorld.com's RC Fishing Pole, it's time to be a kid again. So visit www.rcfishingworld.com today. Did you know that Bass Angler Magazine has more articles than any other bass fishing publication? And with the top pros from around the nation spilling the beans in every issue, there's really no reason for you not to be subscribed to the most informative bass fishing magazine there is. Bass Angler Magazine. Thanks for watching, guys. Now let's get back to the show. Here we go again. Hooks. Check your hook points. I've seen guys like hitting rocks and then hook a big fish right after. Fish comes off, comes up, the hook point's bent over. Take your hook, I'm a pretty shaky dude, rub it across your finger, it'll stick. You got a good hook point on there, if you're rubbing the tip across your finger, it'll stick. It won't just slide smoothly, it'll stick into you with that point. So keep sharp hooks. That's extremely vital for hook penetration, hook sets, not losing fish. If you're not fishing with a sharp hook, Go home. You need sharp hooks. Trocar, awesome hooks, about as sharp as they possibly get. All right, now another thing along with your hooks. When you're in somebody's boat, and most pros know this, do not stick it in one of the eyes or the guides. Do not stick your hook in there. You're gonna end up chipping it or putting a scratch in there, and you're gonna start rubbing that line when you go to fish, and you're gonna cast, and you're gonna get frays in your line. Your line's gonna end up breaking, at a less tensile strength than it would be if you were to never do that. So don't do that because they're not going to detect that little scratch in there and it's going to mess it up. So always go look for that line clip. If there's not one on there, find a way to hook it onto the reel handle. But do not put it inside the eyes. That's a big no-no. At the same time, do not reel it all the way up to the tip to where it's going to get jammed into the tip of that rod. Do not do that. The small eye is more sensitive than the rest of the eyes. If you jam it in there and it's banging around on the tip of the boat, it's smacking into there. Look how small that thing is. If I, I'm not going to detect that you scratched it inside there or put a crack in there. All I'm going to notice is I'm losing fish or I'm getting broken off and then I have to replace my eye. So do not do that. Always focus on that, please. Um, a lot of guys say, well, I like to reel it up to the tip because I get my line tangled. Uh, around because let me let me show you exactly what I'm talking about right here if you put it inside the clip there and you lay it down on the deck a lot of guys get their rods tangled together they lay them down and one lure gets caught in this line going back down to your bait real simple trick take your rod in your hand hold this line and spin your rod a couple times around and go right around the eye and it smooths all the line down against the rod blank right there. Now you can put a bunch on top of each other and when you go to pick them up, they're usually not tangled. Here's another thing, confidence bait. How many times have you heard a guy that you thought was a good angler say, I always catch him on this bait, baloney. You're not gonna always catch them on the same bait. Yeah, this is a big old whopper plopper here. Yeah, I know this is not what you're gonna catch them on every single day. But when you have this mindset that I'm always going to catch them on this bait, you have your favorite spinner bait, or you have your favorite little jerk bait, or rip bait for trout, or your little jig for crappie, your favorite thing, 
if you're stuck in the mindset that this is your magic lure, tell yourself that you suck, okay? Because every good angler thinks that when you tell them that. Do not have a favorite lure. You could say, I enjoy fishing this lure. This is what I usually catch them on. But if you think you're gonna catch them on the same lure every single day, you're wrong. Fish are moody, fish just ate, they want a smaller meal, they need something that's easy, they need to be irritated sometimes. So do not have a favorite lure. And another thing, if you're not fishing a tournament, don't go to your confidence spots to start with. Start off new areas. Look at new points, new humps, uh, new boat docks. Fish something new every time. Little saddles, humps between islands out there, or new little bushes if you're jigging for crappie or if you're trolling for trout. Try new areas. That's going to make you much more effective. How do you think you got that one spot that you love so much in the beginning? Well, maybe your buddy told you, or maybe you just happen to run into it. Well, what happens when you go out there that next day, and guess what? They're not home. The wind's been blowing the opposite direction the whole time. The bait decided to shift over there because somebody spilled something in the water over here, or the oxygen was just low in that part of the lake. They don't live there anymore. Well, now you're back to guessing. And yeah, that's kind of like trying a new spot. But, you know, spend the first half of the day when you go to a lake, unless you're in a competition, then hit your confidence spots, sure. But spend the first half of the day, every time you go out on your favorite body of water, looking for new areas. And then if you're not catching fish, go back to your confidence areas and wrap up the day having a good time. But you need to try new areas. You need to try new baits. It's going to become a go-to habit for you, and you're going to develop new skills. You're going to learn new spots, and you're going to start beating people if you ever want to join a competition. I don't care if it's trout, bass, crappie, carp, striped bass, you name it you will become 10 times more effective and you'll become a great angler focusing on using different baits, learning new things, new rods, new lines, and new areas. You have to think outside the box. Fishing is not easy when you start getting into the upper levels. It's not just soaking a worm for a bluegill anymore, guys. Fishing's hard and you have to use your brain if you want to become an expert. Now, let's get back to line for a minute. The line is the wheels on your car. We have to replace the tires on our car frequently. If the tread's down, we're going to start slipping in the rain, right? Wet streets, we're going to slip. When we go off, to road, off the road, we need thicker tread. We need bigger tires. We need to get that traction. Line is absolutely imperative. It's the direct connection between you and that fish. Do not neglect it. This is pretty obvious, but retie a knot every time. If you have a bait tied on from the time before, cut it and retie it. That knot is in an odd position, it has stress, it's going to fatigue, it's going to get wear and tear. Retie every time. If you feel like you rub things multiple times during retrieving your bait, pick your line up and check it just above there. Check it and rub it with your fingers and see if you feel any frays in there or if you see any little frays sticking off. If you do, go up at least six to eight inches, cut it off, take that and retie it back on. You're going to land a lot more fish like that and not have those breakoffs. Neglecting that is horrible. Uh, another thing you need to do, you need to be on board with letting your fishing line do the job. A lot of guys crank down their drag. They over crank it. I don't know what the rush is to get that fish to the boat. If you hook them, fight them, enjoy it. I understand if he's down really fast thick and like big logs and everything, you got to crank it down and you got to use heavier line to rip them out. But when there's not a lot of debris around for that fish to run into, you need to make sure you utilize your drag. You know, you need to be able to let that fish pull it off when he needs to go. You're overstressing your rod, you're overstressing your line when you don't utilize your drag. You're potentially tearing hooks. Um, you have to utilize it. An important way to get your drag just right is if your rod's like a uh, a fast action and it bends right up here in the tip. Get your drag just enough to where once it starts stressing slightly past that point of bending just in the tip, drag comes off. You're going to be more effective. You're not going to tear hooks out. You're not going to break your line. You have to use your drag. Um, you got to keep that in mind. This is where everybody goes wrong. When they break a fish off, you know what you did wrong right when you break the fish off. Get that stuff done ahead of time. Get your drag adjusted ahead of time. Retie your hooks ahead of time. Get your new baits on there. Check for line fray before you ever leave the house because you don't want to do that on the water.
Now another thing that a lot of guys neglect to pay any mind to, no matter what species you're fishing, no matter if you're trolling, you're casting, you're bait and dunking, a lot of the time, how thick your line is, the diameter of your line, how heavy your gear is, how big the hooks are, how heavy the weight is, you always want to be as light as you can possibly get away with. And you'll see this, if you're a troller, go out there with 12 pound tests and put that identical rip bait on the right side of the boat and then use four pound tests on the opposite side of the boat. Just watch, a higher percentage of the time that fish is going to take that lighter setup. It's much more natural, your baits will move more natural, but at the same time you need to be able to get them in your boat. So it's finding that fine balance between too light and too heavy because more often than not the fish are going to bite lighter. The lighter the setup, the lightest weight you can get away with, increases your odds. The lightest line you can get away with, increases your odds. The lightest gear you can get away with using those because you have to at that point is going to increase your odds. The heavier stuff you have is more for winching and it's getting up to that bigger fish so it's not necessarily using heavy gear to take out small fish unless they're buried in cover which you have to do. But a lot of the time if you're fishing for a fish that's 300 pounds you're going to have to use 400 pound line. You know you can't get away with that super light stuff at that point but there's always a balance for getting that fish to go and it's always more natural the lighter you can go. So it's always about as light as you can get away with. Another thing that I forgot to cover is in that awareness part that I was talking about. When you pull down a bank or when you pull up to a tree, look at the bank. Is there fresh green grass over there? Does it look dead? Because dead plant life that touches the water consumes oxygen. It takes it out. There's going to be less life there. Greenery in the water promotes life. So if you have the option on the identical points and this one has more life on it, it looks green, the plant life looks lively, the odds of better fish being there, more fish, bigger fish are going to be in that greener lifelike area versus that dead area because there's less oxygen, less life. So keep that in mind for that awareness part is look for things that look fresh, look vibrant, look green, and that's going to hold a lot better fish for you. Here's another thing that I see professional anglers still doing. We make our cast out there with our spinning rod and we start to reel to close the bale. That's bad news. You can see there's a partial little bow in there. What that does, if we fish that a lot, the line's going to start fastening back down and around that loose line to where about 15-20 casts later, you're going to get an extra loop or you're going to see a loop in your spool and you're going to get that little line twist. It's going to promote line twist. It's going to promote a backlashing in your spool. So do not do that. Always after making your cast, reach up just right under. This is how I always hold my hand. I reach up and I close my bail manually. Then I close my fingers and I always go forward like that. I've trained myself to do that to where it's basically automatic at that point now. I cast, I'm still looking right at it, I don't even look at my reel, I close and I pull my line. And what that does is it keeps it tight on your spool and you don't have to worry about backlashes or big loops of line twists coming off your spool like that. So if you're running into that problem, focus on closing the bale manually, follow the line up easy through your fingers. And another thing you can do to tighten that line up is lift your rod. See that sitting over there on my futon? nice and loose. I pick up my rod tip, see that tight line there? That's just going to pick up line naturally for you. So after your cast, you can raise your rod tip. That'll help tighten the line. You can walk it out through your fingers and close manually every time. Now here's a question I get asked all the time, no matter what species it is, what type of angler they are. They ask me, how much time should I spend in a spot? And that's an incredible question. That's the, that's the winning question right there. What is wasting time? How do you know that you're wasting time? You can look, okay, and you can say, well, if I'm moving down the bank and I'm casting, let's say I'm bass fishing and I'm casting, how long should I spend in a spot? How long should I cover, you know, that bush? Let's say the bush is relatively big and it takes four or five casts to hit each spot of the bush. Well, make those four or five casts with the lure that you think is going to work properly for that particular tree or that particular bush at that time. If it doesn't work, find a complete opposite lure, repeat those casts, make sure you show the fish that are living on that structure or cover two or three different presentations and two or three things at the same time, not so much the time. Make sure you show them something different each time. That's same thing with that retrieval, same thing with that speed. You want to do it with different lures too at the same time. 
So you have to show, basically if you have confidence that there's fish in this spot, make sure you try a few different things at a few different speeds and retrieval cadences in each of those spots. Not the time, just make sure you cover it. I'm Nick the Informative Fisherman, and that's common fishing mistakes. I might do another one of these guys later on, so I'll think of some more elaborate mistakes you can possibly make, fine-tune them even better, help you become a better angler. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.